We were six hours away from home on a missions trip in the backwoods of West Virginia. It was beautiful country, and unfortunately in that part of the part of the country there's a lot of poverty as well, and we were there to help rebuild parts of a community as well as do some programming for school-age kids. I was in middle school. I was 13 years old at the time. And on our first night there, we had some downtime, and we were staying in an old schoolhouse, and they had a gym. And when you walked in, you could still smell the old hot dogs and popcorn, and there was a beat-up basketball court. And we found some basketballs, and we went out to play. And when you're 13, every pickup game is your chance to be Michael Jordan. It's your chance to prove to the world that you are destined for the NBA. And so the competition was fierce, and it was a close game. And then some people from town came up, and they decided that they asked if they could jump into the game. And we said, absolutely, jump on in. And one of them was an older gentleman, and he was a, he was a little shorter guy, which nothing against shorter guys, but if you're playing basketball, probably not the sport for you unless you're, unless you're incredibly quick and incredibly skilled, which he was not. Uh, so I was elated when the other team picked him until I learned a very valuable lesson in the game, and that is you don't have to be the tallest or the fastest in order to get a rebound. You just have to know how to throw around your body weight. And this guy did. And he was just getting like every rebound. And finally, a shot went up. And I'm like, this is my chance. This is my chance to get the rebound. And as I was standing there, he moved in. And our bodies collided. And I flew. He did not move. He got the rebound. And that's the last thing I remember seeing before I heard crack. And my eyes went dark for a minute. And then I just felt the shooting pain out of my shoulder area. And the cracking noise was my collarbone that had busted in two. They called an ambulance, and I had to go on an ambulance ride with a broken collarbone through the back roads in the mountains of West Virginia. And every time that ambulance would take a turn and the the bed would just slightly shift, pain would just shoot out of my broken collarbone. And we finally made it into the emergency room. And I was in more pain, I think, from the ride there than I was the initial break. And then the curtain opened, and I saw her. And I was in love. She was the emergency nurse, and she had to have been fresh out of med school. And normally, in hindsight, I probably would have been like, ooh, maybe want somebody with a little bit more experience. But at 13 years old, I was so happy to see her. It was incredible. And she looked at me, and she said, sweetheart. I'm like, yes, yes. She said, sweetheart, you're going to be just fine. If you need anything, you let me know. I'm like, okay, I will. And she looked over, she looked over at the two youth leaders who were with me, and she's like, are, are one of these guys your dad? And I'm like, no, uh, my parents are in Ohio, we're from Ohio, they're like six hours away. She said, I will take care of you. And I'm like, thank you, thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your blessings. She would bring me popsicles. She was great, she was great. But there was something so reassuring about hearing her tell me, you have nothing to worry about you'll be fine. And maybe it's just because she was really pretty. Maybe it's because I was 13. Maybe it's because I was just out of the ambulance ride and no longer having to endure the the shifting of the bed in those back road roads. Whatever the case would be, my heart was set at ease. Now, they still had to, they still had to put me in the, the thing, however they get your bone, they, they put you in this brace, and they still had to do that, and that was not a fun process to go through. That was painful, and that hurt quite a bit. But my mentality changed as soon as the ride was over and somebody told me, everything's going to be all right. And the message that Jesus has for us today is that everything is going to be all right for those of us who follow him. And I don't know what this week has brought you. I don't know the uncertainty of the past year, how it has, 
how it is just magnified. I don't know all of the details, all the intimate details in your life, but I do know that now more than ever, we need to be reminded that as people who follow Jesus, we have hope. And the promise of Jesus is that everything's going to be all right. And how can we hold on to this promise? And how can we have such assuredness of that fact that people would just look at us and say, well, to live that way, you're just being an optimist. You're not being a realist. You're not looking at the reality of the current situation. You're just seeing the glasses half full. But it's something bigger than that. And how can we hold on to that? Well, that's what we're going to investigate today. So if you have your phones or your tablets, I'd invite you to follow along with us. In the book of John, it's a New Testament book. We're going to be in John 14 today. John 14, we're going to start in verse 1 as we continue looking at all the I am statements that Jesus made about himself as he told us exactly who he is. And so this morning we dive into John 14, verse 1, where we start with these words, let not your hearts be troubled. Let not your hearts be troubled. This is straight from the mouth of Jesus to his disciples. And he said, let not your hearts be troubled. And, and that's just something that I just want us to pause and reflect on. That I, I don't know everything that's been thrown your way. But I know it's been a lot. It's been a lot for all of us, and I don't know exactly what it is for you, but I know that it's been something, and it's been significant. And the message of Jesus and the hope that Jesus offers us is this, that there is a way that we can live our lives that our hearts don't have to be troubled. Let not your hearts be troubled. Now, again, you might say, Brian, you're just being an optimist. You're just looking at this, and you're, you're just over-spiritualizing everything. And so let me give you the context where Jesus enters into these words. We're coming out of John 13, and in John 13, he tells his disciples, I'm going to die. And, by the way, when Jesus says here, let not your hearts be troubled, the verse right before this, he told Peter, one of his closest friends in the entire world, he told Peter, you're going to deny me, not once, not twice, but you are going to deny me three times. So as people who've been following Jesus around for three years, and they've seen him perform a number of miracles, and they've listened to him teach, and they've seen some incredible things, they have hung out with God himself. And now, he, now Jesus tells them, I am not going to set up the kingdom that you thought I was going to set up in a, in a traditional sense and just become the instant king over everyone, but I'm actually going to go die. And oh, by the way, one of you who also happens to be one of my best friends in the entire world, you're going to deny me three times. And right on the heels of that, Jesus says, let not your hearts be troubled. This wasn't an easy time. This wasn't an easy circumstance. This wasn't an easy situation. And yet the message of Jesus is even when times aren't easy, even when circumstances go in a different way than we would choose, even when we don't even know what's next, there's hope. Let not your hearts be troubled. And we don't have time today to conduct a list of all the ways and all the reasons why our hearts could be and quite frankly probably are troubled right now. We don't have that time, but we are given the antidote. And that's the important thing. We're given the antidote. If your heart is troubled right now, if you find yourself stressed, if you find yourself losing hope, if you find yourself weighed down by anxiety, if you find yourself in the throes of, of just thinking, it's never going to get better for me, Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. Well, how can we make it so our hearts aren't troubled? Well, verse 14, or excuse me, John 14, verse 1 continues. Believe in God, believe also in me. Believe in God, believe also in me. Now, I know what the skeptic's thinking right now. Oh, it's in the age of corona when I've lost my job and someone in my family has passed away and all of my relationships are fractured. I'm supposed to not let my heart be troubled. 
And the answer to all of this, the answer to, to me getting a job, the answer to my family being made whole, the answer, the answer to my relationships being restored, the answer to all of that is to believe in God. I know that's what the skeptic's thinking. And I'm asking you, just follow with me this morning, please. Just follow with me. Because while it may be easy to dismiss on its face, I believe there's something so profound in what Jesus has spoken that it truly will, it truly will transform our lives and our outlooks. So how can this be? How can believing in God change everything? What does believing in God entail that could make it so our hearts could arrive at this position of peace. And Jesus is telling his disciples here, put your hope in me. Put your hope in me. And he goes on. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? Let not your hearts be troubled, Jesus says. Believe in God, believe also in me. And then Jesus completely changes the dynamic. And he moves from the trouble of this life, from the angst and the anxiety and the worry and all of the things that we face in this fractured and broken world, and he moves from this life into the next. And it's a seamless transition for Jesus. It's almost like this this great divide that we have put between our lives here and the eternal aspect of our lives that lives forever doesn't exist with God. It's almost like while we divorce the two concepts sometime in our thinking and how we process things and all of our focus is only on the here and now and that which can be seen, that doesn't exist in God's outlook of things. Let not your heart be troubled, Jesus says. Believe in God, believe also in me. I am going to prepare a place for you. And here we're reminded that this world and all of its troubles and all of its hardship and all the things that we are going to face, this world is not our home. This world is not our destination. We are on a journey. We are on a trip. This isn't forever. This is temporary. And the picture that Jesus gives us here is of God having massive mansions. Of God having massive mansions with space for all who believe in Him. And what is He doing? God is preparing a place for you. For you as a follower of Jesus. God is preparing a place for you individually as a follower of Jesus. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? You, personally, as a follower of Jesus. Think of this. That Jesus is designing for you your own place to dwell with God forever. I got married ten and a half years ago. And at the time, I had beautiful artwork all over my house. Black and white baseball scenes from history. I mean, it was, it was incredible. It was beautiful. Who wouldn't want black and white baseball scenes all over their house? Well, apparently every woman that I talked to. Because one of the first steps, one of the first steps that happened when I got married was my freedoms were taken away. Because all, all of my black and white baseball scenes came down. I, I walked into the apartment one day, and, and I thought we'd been pranked by a, by, a bunch of, by a bunch of postmodern hippies. Like they'd all just broken into my house and taken down some of the greatest scenes in baseball history and put up abstract art? What happened in here? I got married. 
I have, I have all, all these sports, all these beautiful sports scenes that are now relegated to my office here at Lakeside and to my basement, to my basement. Guys, if, if you had a place before you were married, you have felt my pain. I know you felt my pain because as, as soon, as soon as we get married and the wife moves in, gone are the decorations that look good. And now she's, she's decorating. She's going to be like, does it look nice? And you're still a newlywed, so you don't know how far you can take the truth yet. And you're like, it looks great, honey. I'm, I'm glad you're happy. But you lose your rights. And your house, your house looks different. It's not yours anymore. It's yours collectively-ish. But you're lucky if you get the basement or an office. And she's decorating everything else. And Jesus says, I'm preparing a place for you. For you. Which means Brooke can have a mansion with all of her postmodern hippie art everywhere she wants. And I can have some of the greatest scenes of baseball history all over that God knows you individually. And he is preparing a place forever and ever in his kingdom, perfectly suited for you. Do you understand this? Let not your heart be troubled because you have a creator who knows you and loves you and sees you as an individual and who's creating something just for you as you are in his glory and as you worship him forever and ever that it takes on the unique way that God has designed you. And that's your forever home. And it's yours. And it's designed by your creator just for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself. That where I am, you may be also. Jesus says, I'm not just going to, to prepare a place, just, just to prepare a place. Like there's a purpose behind this. And the purpose is that we will be together forever. Jesus says, I'm your access to this place. I'm your access to this place. I'm your VIP pass. I'm the way that you can get there. And the disciples didn't understand yet that all of the, all of the things that Jesus had talked about in chapter 13, the fact that he would lay down his life, were the plan of God in order to make a way for them and for us to have this restored relationship with God, for them and for us to be with God forever in a place where there is no sorrow and there is no loss, a place of absolute perfection where we are with our Creator and He is with us and we worship Him and have a restored relationship with Him in the way we were originally designed. And Jesus says, I am your access. I am your past. I am the way that this can happen, that we may be with him. Understand the reward of heaven. The reward of heaven is being with our creator. The reward of heaven is being with our savior. The reward of heaven is being in God's presence. The reward of heaven is not that we escaped hell. The reward of heaven is that we are with God. And that's our reward. And God is creating a place for us individually and personally. And you know the way to where I'm going, Jesus says. And you know the way to where I'm going. Jesus tells them, you know the truth. You've been with me for three years. You've seen the miracles. You've heard the teachings. You know what this is about. You know the way to this place. You know the path. 
You know the path so that you can go through life and let not your heart be troubled. It doesn't mean that everything is going to be easy. It doesn't mean that God's never going to allow bad things to happen to us. But there is a way for us to continue to walk through life without our hearts being troubled. And Jesus tells them, and you know this path. You know this path. You know the way to where I'm going. You know the truth. And Thomas in verse 5 said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? I don't know if Thomas raised his hand. I don't know if he just jumped in. I don't know the dynamic yet at, the, at this point. Jesus is like, you know the way. And Thomas is like, nope. No, we don't. No, we don't. We don't know where you're going, so we don't know the way. For three years, he walked with Jesus. For three years, he saw For three years, he was there, day in, day out, every step of the journey. And Jesus says, you know the way. And he says, no, we don't. I'm fascinated by this. I'm fascinated by the patience of our God. I'm fascinated by the fact that somebody who walked with Jesus for three years can interject and say, Jesus, we don't know. And he was comfortable enough to just bring up his concerns And then we're going to, in a minute, see how Jesus responds. But I just want to encourage you. Maybe you don't have this all figured out. Maybe you don't know exactly where you fall on on your journey of faith. Maybe you haven't, haven't really just come to the place where you know fully what you think about God and what you think about Jesus. And I just want to just want to invite you to know that you really are welcome here. And we want nothing more than for you to realize the joy that comes from being a follower of Jesus. We want nothing more for you to realize the way that you can live a life where you don't have to let your heart be troubled. We hope that is something that you will experience in life. But if you're just seeking, you're just searching, and you're not really sure, and you've got questions, I want to encourage you. You are welcome here, and we're glad that you're here. And we're never going to run from your questions. Never think because you have a question, because there's something you don't understand, that you're not free to ask it. For the things that don't make sense, ask. And if we can explain it to you, we'll explain it to you. If we can point you to Scripture, we'll point you to Scripture. But just because you don't have it all figured out, don't feel like you you aren't welcome here, and don't feel like you have to pretend like you do. Because Thomas doesn't. And he's one of the disciples And he walked with Jesus for three years. So if somebody who walks with Jesus for three years can still have some questions, that ought to make all of us feel better about ourselves. Because we all have some questions. Now some have questions and and you haven't yet made the decision to follow Jesus. Others of us have made the decision to follow Jesus, but we still have some questions. We still have some things that don't fully make sense to us. And my suspicion is there will always be some things that don't fully make sense to us. Simply because God operates on a higher level than we can even comprehend. And there are some things that we're meant to understand. There's some things that are meant to be very clear, and those things are are made very clear to us in Scripture, and those things are, are made black and white. But there are other things that are much more difficult to decipher. And I just want to encourage you, don't beat yourself up if you still have some questions. Thomas did. And he mentioned them to Jesus. And I think what's also interesting is the context behind this. Now, we've talked a little bit about what was happening in John chapter 13, the chapter right before where we started looking this morning. Think about this. You've been following Jesus for three years. You've heard all the Old Testament prophecies about the fact that God would bring a king for his people. And so you're expecting Jesus, if he is the Messiah, who he said he was, to establish his kingdom. And then he says, I'm going to die. I don't think it's, I don't think it's a coincidence. In the midst of that, 
The doubt and the uncertainty crept into Thomas's head. That in the midst of hardship, in the midst of a different paradox than what he was expecting, when he had expectations and yet reality didn't match up with those expectations, in that moment, the doubt and the uncertainty crept into Thomas's head. And in a year where for many of us, expectations and reality haven't aligned. How many of us have wrestled through questions? How do we know where you are going? How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. How can we know the way, Jesus? Jesus says, because I am the way. See, our Savior heard the concerns. And he responded. And it wasn't a time to beat Thomas up for a lack of faith. It wasn't time to say, shut up, Thomas. I'm God. I don't have to explain myself to you. He said, I'll see your question, Thomas, and I'll answer it. You want to know how you can know? Because I am the way. I am the truth. And I am the life. Jesus hears the question. He responds with exclusive statements. That he is the way, which means there's one. Not a way. Jesus said, I am the way. There's one path to God, and that's through his son, Jesus. It's not like when you open up your phone and you put in an address on the Maps app and it gives you three or four ways that you can choose how you want to go if you want to avoid tolls, if you want to take the scenic route, which really, I mean, who really does that? If you're going for a drive on the scenic route, are you really going to put it into your Maps? I don't know. It doesn't make sense to me, but whatever. You know, when you have four options, it's not like that. Jesus says you have one option. There's one path to your destination. Your destination is to God. I'm it. I'm the path. If you want to arrive at a relationship with God, it's through me. That's it. I'm it. Jesus says, I am the way. There's one way. Jesus says, I am the truth. There's one truth. Oh, that'll get people to lose their minds in this day and age. That'll get people to go absolutely crazy. When everybody wants to be able to claim their truth, like their truth, no, Jesus says, I am the truth. There's one doesn't matter what your truth is. It doesn't matter what my truth is. It matters what the truth is. And Jesus says, I am the truth. I'm it. I'm the truth. And I'm the life. I'm the way. I'm the truth. And I am the life, which, by the way, is the end goal. And Jesus alone possesses the life of God. No one comes to the Father except through me. And Jesus just makes it as exclusive as it possibly can be. He says, no one comes to the Father except through me. Which means that your good deeds are not enough. That you are not enough. That any other religious system, apart from understanding that Jesus is our path to God, that he loved us when we had nothing to offer him, he died on the cross for our mistakes, for our sins, and three days later he rose again, and we achieve our faith by putting our trust in what Jesus accomplished on our behalf. Anything apart from that is not a path to God. And then Jesus wraps it up by saying this in verse 7. 
If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. And Jesus here is telling his disciples, you just, you haven't gotten it yet. You haven't gotten it yet. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. Why? Because Jesus is the path to God. So if we know Jesus, we know God. Jesus is God. And from now on, you do know him and have seen him. Jesus says, I've just made this clear to you. I've just told you exactly how this has to function. I've just told you how you can have hope. I've just told you how you can experience a relationship with God. I've just summed up how you can have hope. But they hadn't gotten it yet until that point. And I wonder, is the same true for you? I wonder, is the same true for you? That you've got ideas about Jesus. And you like the concept of Jesus. But you haven't made that leap yet. To making Him the Savior of your life. And you haven't made the leap yet to finding the hope and forgiveness that is only available through Him. Or maybe you have. And maybe you've given your life to Him. Or maybe you've accepted that Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. So the question, the question for you is, is, now what? Now what? In a time in which we live, we're... Where this idea that there's one path to God and there's one truth and that we can only experience life through the one path to God and that's a relationship with God through His Son Jesus and we can only experience the truth which there's only one truth through a relationship with Jesus. What do we do with this? If we've made that decision to follow God. Well, for those who've made that decision, I want to encourage you to do a couple things. One is share that hope. Share the hope that you have. And how can we have hope? How can we, in in the midst of all that's going on, how can we have hope so that our hearts are not troubled because we realize that this world is not our final destination? And we realize that in the view of eternity, the dumpster fire that 2020 was and that the coronavirus has been is and it's gone. That's not to minimize the suffering that you've experienced. It's not to say that your pain isn't real and just to be diminished. But in the grand scheme of things, in light of all of eternity, It's a blink. And sometimes when we find ourselves in the midst of such trying times, we need to zoom out and be reminded of the bigger picture. So what Jesus did. So let not your heart be troubled. Because you're mine. And I know you. And I'm preparing a place for you. And I see you're wrestling through uncertainty, and I see you're you're processing through things you don't understand, and I love you, and I'm going to walk through that with you. And that's our Savior. That's who He is. And that's what He's done. If you are on the fence, I am begging you, you keep investigating. Because God has nothing to hide. And one day, when you give your life to Him, you will experience an understanding like you've never experienced before. 
of how you can go through life without your heart being troubled. And it's not because we ignore things. It's not because we bury our heads in the sand. It's not because we're eternal optimists and say everything's just going to be great. But it's because we have the perspective that the way, the truth, and the life knows us, loves us, and is preparing a place for us with him forevermore. God, I pray that in the midst of the chaos and the craziness and the uncertainty, the hardships and the heartaches, pray in the midst of all of those things that we could live lives where we would say let not our hearts be troubled not because we bury our heads in the sand but because we have a proper perspective of who you are and what you've done Pray for the person who just needs to submit and surrender their lives to you. Who's been trying to fight it on their own, only to realize they can't. But they're stubborn and they want to. And I pray, God, you would just get a grip of their heart. And maybe even today would be the day that they acknowledge the fact that they're a sinner. They need you to save them. That their hope is not built on what they can accomplish, or what they can do, but on what you have accomplished and what you have done by dying on the cross for our sins and raising again three days later and offering life to any who would ask it from you as a free gift, something none of us can earn. something you've accomplished. I pray for those who've made the decision to follow you that we would live lives of hope. That when our expectations and realities don't match up, we'd be reminded that you're in control. No matter what this world throws our way, our hearts don't have to be troubled because you are the way, the truth, and the life.